You're listening to Let's Talk AI. Okay, good day and welcome to Let's Talk AI. Today's guest is Brakoslaw Lachowski, and he's going to talk to us about uh, the great work he's doing in wearables. So over to you, Brock. Well, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, before we get started today, I, uh, I just want to take this opportunity to show our support for the people of Ukraine who are fighting for the principles of freedom and democracy against the Russian invasion. Um, and I also want to uh, uh, take a moment to mention uh, an initiative that myself and several other scientists from around the world are developing called Science for Ukraine. And the purpose of the initiative is to provide funding opportunities and support programs for students and researchers who have been affected by the war. And so if you want to learn more about that program, uh, I would encourage you to visit scienceforukraine.eu. And lastly, I do want to mention that uh, the research lab uh, that I have at, that I work for at the University of Toronto, we are recruiting uh, remote research positions for those who have been affected by the war. Uh, so if you have an interest in deep learning, computer vision, machine learning, neural networks, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Excellent. Well, thanks for that intro. So let's let's jump in to learn. And it's okay if I call you Brock. Yes. Excellent. Okay, Brock. So let's jump in and and learn more about uh, about you. And how did you get started on this path? What was that first time that you knew AI is for me? What's it about? Tell us more about that. So I did my PhD at the University of Waterloo. Um, I also did my master's there, uh, but not in AI specifically. Um, I did a lot of work in computer modeling and simulation of human biomechanics. And when I got into my PhD, I wanted to translate some of the things that I learned in biomechanics, uh, specifically working with wheelchair athletes. And I wanted to apply that to devices that can assist uh, individuals in daily life. And so I started looking to what are some technologies that are available. And I pretty quickly got immersed in this whole field of what we refer to as wearable robotics. Uh, and generally these include prosthetic legs as well as exoskeleton devices that are worn on top of or in parallel with the biological legs. And when I was discussing with my, my research team at, at Waterloo, what are the opportunities to improve these technologies? We started to look at uh, some of the limitations with regards to their control. And so I will say that right now, e even now, I believe all commercially available powered exoskeletons are controlled using some type of manual system. So if a user is wearing an exoskeleton, they will perform some type of exaggerated movement or use a mobile device or a joystick to communicate to the robot what does the user want to do. Does the user want to walk, stand still, maybe sit down? Um, this is kind of analogous to standard driving where a driver will be driving a car and they themselves are manually controlling the car and communicating to the car where do they want to go and how fast do they want to go. Obviously, there's been this new proliferation and development of autonomous cars where the car uses sensors and various forms of machine learning to make these decisions for itself. So the cars control themselves. So I was speaking to my research team at Waterloo, taking inspiration from autonomous cars and started thinking about, could we automate the control of some of these wearable robots similar to autonomous cars? Can we give them that intelligence using the current sensors that are on these devices? Okay, so if we look at 
you know, you, the analogy you gave a car and there's a brake pedal and a gas pedal. Are there, if someone was wearing one of these exoskeletons, are there, are there these kind of levers or triggers or things like, is it something they activate with their hands, with their feet, with their, like, or is it, is it, is it sensing, you know, the leg movements and things and then ex, it makes, accentuates them or, or what are these, I call them levers. What are these actuation things, the actuators or the controls, the joystick, I think you called it. Can you elaborate further on that? Yeah. So in commercial systems, it's all done primarily using manual control. So the user, an example would be, there would be a smartphone application and in the application, the user would specify how fast do they want to go. And it could be very simple as two buttons, one with a negative, one with a positive sign. When you click the positive sign, the exoskeleton walks faster. And when you click the negative sign, the exoskeleton walks slower. We obviously want to try to automate this process. And there are researchers doing that where based on sensors in the leg, for example, maybe that read the torque or the, the angular displacement of various joints, it can then kind of infer what does the user want to do? Oh, it looks like the user wants to walk faster Then you know, we'll provide more assistance and more torque from the motors. Um, right, and then the opposite, it would be true if you want to slow down, for example. So there is those automated systems being developed. What's kind of unique about some of the stuff that myself and my team at Waterloo started to do is integrating vision within this. So this is very important for predicting the future states. So current devices that are developed, current autonomous systems that are being developed in research labs all around the world, use sensors that can give you information about the current state of the robot and the user. So what is the user and the robot currently doing? If they don't have the ability to predict what does the user necessarily want to do in four steps. And that's one of the great things about vision. And this is why vision has been so important in not only human walking, so human control, we have we use our eyes for planning and obstacle avoidance. We also see this in cars where the integration of vision, cameras, LIDAR, radar, these allow the car to plan and predict. And that's one of the unique things that we started to do at Waterloo is we were kind of one of the first labs to start including vision into these automated control systems. Wow, this is, and now is there, is it going to go further? Is there going to be voice commands, uh, other other inputs? But uh, you can answer that one, but tell us more about the vision here. So is it sensing, I think you called it obstacle avoidance. Is it sensing there's a wall in front of me uh, that if I take my fourth step, I'm going to hit the wall, therefore I don't take that step? Is that the kind of feedback it's, it's looking for? It can, yes. We provide information about a wide variety of different walking environments. And in order to train machine learning systems to identify these unique environments, because they really are unique to walking, we have to collect data specifically to train these machine learning systems, assuming it's a supervised system, not unsupervised. And I'm sure your listeners of an AI podcast probably know the difference, but we can go into what are the differences between the two. Um, it requires a lot of data. These are data-driven systems. And so that's the first thing we did is that we ended up strapping cameras to a bunch of people and having them walk around and collect data. Most Image data sets are generated based on satellite images and driving cars that collect, you know, tons of images from just driving about our world. Um, this is very different than walking environments like staircases or, for example, right now I'm at my home office. And if I wanted to navigate my home office, go up and down the stairs within my townhouse, um, perhaps walk to my car, which requires several steps. You can't get these very unique images from previous data sets. So that's kind of the first thing that we've kind of had to develop and it's become fairly popular is developing this very large data set of walking environments, the, the images of walking environments. Okay, so take on this, this supervised, unsupervised scenario. You put the cameras on the people and they go and walk and you collect it. So I guess 
how would you describe the people? Are they supervised or unsupervised in what they're doing? Or you've just told them, walk around campus, and they just walk and, and take a path? Or Elaborate further, please. Oh, so with regards to supervised versus unsupervised, I was referring to the machine learning systems. Uh, yeah. R- right. I understand that. But, but I'm thinking you had to get this data set. So now that you've got it, is that data set still considered supervised or unsupervised when it, when it goes to your robot? So um, the data sets that the, the pipeline that we currently use in our research is all based on, uh, it's all supervised. So we provide the labels to the machine learning system. There is an opportunity in the future with developing unsupervised systems to use the unlabeled data and using unsupervised or or, uh, reinforcement learning based systems does have a lot of advantages, especially in the front end where it doesn't require comprehensive manual annotations. It took me perhaps a half a year working every day just labeling these images. It's quite comprehensive. Um, and this is, this is for a long time has been the standard in computer vision where you have one or multiple researchers just labeling images and then using those label data to train in a supervised manner, a uh, deep learning network, for example. Um, and, and that's what we primarily focused on in the project that I worked on at the University of Waterloo, but that doesn't preclude other researchers from around the world to use our open source data set for unsupervised uh, practices. Right. Okay, so what does the camera care if it's a desk or a chair? It's still an object. I'm still going to trip over it. Do you actually have to go in and say this is a desk, this is a chair, or do you define it not with the way the human would just by height and weight and mass and things like that? How do you do? How do you label these images? That's a great question. It's defined based off of the control of the exoskeleton or the prosthetic leg. So you're right. Perhaps these devices don't care the difference between a desk versus a cabinet. They're both obstacles that the user can't walk through. And those things aren't differentiated within our data set. However, you did mention a chair. And that is differentiated in our data set because we want to know if there's a chair there, perhaps the user wants to sit into it. And that is one of the control systems within an exoskeleton. There are modes within these robotic devices to sit down and stand up from chairs. So if the user wants to do that, it's important for us to be able to identify that there is a seating environment within the proximity of the user and perhaps the user is getting ready to sit down into a chair. And so all of the labeling that we did was directed by the control of these devices. So if there's some particular class or some particular object or walking terrain that is of benefit and that aligns with the control of these devices, then we label them, specifically that. But for everything else, If the control of the robot can't necessarily make use of that information, then it doesn't necessarily make sense for us to then differentiate the labels of, say, a desk versus a cabinet, because the exoskeleton or whatever the wearable robot is, it it can't make use of that information. Okay. Okay. So let's assume this, you got it ready to prototype and you're ready to... Are you going to put this on a human and 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 they're they're the guinea pig? I'm just joking here. Or like, how do you test these when you think we're ready? We're ready to test it. How do you test it? That's a really good question and something that we actually put a lot of thought into. So, the lab that I worked at at the University of Waterloo, uh, it was primarily supervised by uh, John McPhee, who's a professor in systems design engineering. And we also collaborated with Alex Wong, who is another professor in systems design engineering. And both Alex and John use a lot of 
they're big proponents of simulation-based and model-based development. Prior to prototyping anything, one of the cool things about working within a computational space like machine learning or computer modeling is that we can do a lot of testing well before we prototype and we test with humans. And that's kind of been the standard in medical research. That's why we call it quote unquote clinical trials. You give some intervention, it could be a therapeutic intervention, like a, some pharmaceutical, or it could be a device like a pacemaker, or whatever it may be. And we do clinical trials to see how do the users respond and interact with this new intervention. One of the cool things about using modeling and simulation, which again is kind of the focus of Alex Wong and John McPhee is that we can utilize these computational resources that are efficient and they're very cost effective. You're not having to do very large scale human testing. We can do a lot of stuff in simulation. A lot of our machine learning algorithms can be developed and tested on the computer well before we have to do any type of prototyping with physical systems, and more importantly, before we do any testing with humans. So this way they're hopefully safer, and we're able to avoid very comprehensive testing uh, in the lab with humans. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna fast forward to the future and get you the crystal ball here. Let's assume you had a kind of wearable, I don't know, let's call them pants, but a, you know, a lower body, for instance, that somebody, uh, could put these on could these pants walk without the human you know i call it pants could this exoskeleton when you finally had done all the things you just said could it walk on its own would that be the intent that, that's a really good question and it, it's kind of convoluted and i'll answer it in a few different ways um well first if we were to take these exoskeletons, which you refer to them as pants, I guess for some of your viewers who haven't, are they not familiar with that term exoskeleton, robotic pants might be a way of kind of characterizing what these things look like. And so right now we do have these devices at the university and we work with them and we use them in the lab to test our control algorithms. What we do do is we can hang these on a platform and we can have the legs walk for themselves in the air and we can see how do the joints and how do the feet move in space with some control algorithm. So these aren't necessarily walking on the ground by themselves because that would require balance and balance in walking is very complicated. Anybody who works in clinical settings or in robotics will tell you balance is very challenging. But we are able to have the, at least the legs move through space as if they were walking. So if you consider that walking, yes, they can do that on their own. I will say though, if we're talking about legs that can just walk on themselves, a walk by themselves, a great example of that might be some of the humanoids and legged robots, like for example, Boston Dynamics or Agility Robotics. They design bipedal and quadrupedal robots that are able to do these things completely on their own. Right. Yeah, so, because I know I've been to the RoboHub there at University of Waterloo and they have that one large robot, I forgot it, what its name is, and and I know they have it suspended so that it won't fall over because the balance, like you say, is an issue. But I know they've made a lot of progress in making it, you know, in, in walking-like uh, movements and functions. Um, interesting. Uh, you know, I know mass is also very important, you know, and so it's not just the, the mass of the walking suit or the walking legs. It's the person in there as well. And, and where are they with it? So uh, interesting. So where, uh, where does this, where's it all going? What do, what do you think the future holds? Is, is this going to be the kind of thing, um, you know, people who have, um, you know, limited mobility as they age? Is this, is this for the aged? Uh, paint a picture here of what the future looks like. It's a great question. I will say two things. There's advances that need to be done on the design side and advances that need to be done on the control side. And for your viewers who maybe don't have a technical background, design I'm referring to the physical system 
And on the control side, this kind of represents the software. So on the design side, if you've ever seen some of these robots, they're very heavy, very rigid, very cumbersome. Arguably impractical for getting in and out of a car, for example, or wearing in everyday life. So on the design side, we need to do a lot to think about how can we minimize the size and the weight of these devices, and then also their compliance. We don't, in, in, many, exam, in many applications, we probably don't want a device that impedes the user, that makes them work against the robot, because then that would require them to, be, to expend more metabolic energy. And we don't want to make these robots more taxing on the users, um, unless we're using them for some type of maybe physical training and athletic situation. Um, so on the design side, that's what needs to be done. They need to be much more lighter, much more efficient um, and smaller. On the control side, and that's what I focus on, before anything, we need to evaluate what do users want to do. And it's not quite apparent if you were to take total opposite ends of the spectrum, and I'll go back to cars because it's kind of easier to, to paint that picture because this does already exists. If you were to compare fully autonomous cars versus manually controlled cars. What do users prefer? So one can make the argument that humans want to be in control of the car because it gives them a sense of security, a sense of engagement with the car. If you have, you know, if you talk to automotive aficionados, they love the, the feeling of driving some old car and the grinding of the gears and they like that. Whereas other people, they might prefer the idea, or at least the idea, of a fully autonomous car where they can sit back, relax, and they don't have to do anything. With devices like what I'm describing, these wearable robots, what would users prefer? And this is actually divided right now, the theory, in my research field. Some people think that users actually want to be further engaged. They want this... They want this integration of the human and the robot, especially in examples like prosthetic legs, because there is the theory that you would want the user to have a certain level of embodiment. You want, they want to make the leg feel as if it's their own leg. So the more you can integrate, say, the neural system of the human with the robot, there is that sense of agency. And there's people working on brain-machine interfaces and other ways to directly con connect the human with the robot. But there is the downside of that, where it's now the user has to think about controlling the device. Similar to how when you're driving a car manually, you have to think. So, you know, it might be beneficial because it allows for this integration and this sense of embodiment with a, rel with a robotic leg, but it might be more cognitively demanding. And then on the flip side, if it's fully autonomous, this is not actually the case, but the user could just sit back and the legs would walk for them. That's, to be clear, that's not the case as of right now, but in theory, the user could just sit back and the legs would walk for them. But the downside of that is, perhaps the users don't trust the robot. The users want some type of control on the robot to ensure safety, if nothing else. And so where on this spectrum do users prefer? And that's what I want to focus on. That's the research that I'll be doing moving forward is if we were to have two systems, fully manual, where the user just by thinking can control the robot versus fully autonomous, where the robot thinks for itself. And then everything in between, what do users want? What level of engagement do users really want? And, and that's an open question that right now we have, we have very little idea. Wow, well, this is, uh, you paint a, an interesting, you know, path ahead. Um, I'm, we're just going to, actually, I'm going to turn it back to you for any last thoughts or comments. We're getting close to the end here. And, uh, you know, are there any other things you want to say about um, applications or or thoughts? Or is this, um, you talk about what people want. Who's they? Thank you for bringing that up, Harold. That's that is important to mention. Everything that I've discussed thus far is people 
who could be considered to have a mobility impairment. This would include, perhaps most obviously, individuals with spinal cord injury. But people with spinal cord injury actually represent a very small percentage of those with mobility impairments. The overwhelming majority of those within that class would be considered uh, those who have a stroke, osteoarthritis, or perhaps most prominently is the elderly population. The percentage of the world population that is considered 65 plus is fairly large. It's about a half a billion people right now, and that's projected to exponentially increase over the coming decades. So if you're looking to design technologies to help people and have a broad impact, focusing on the older population or the elderly population would appear to be uh, a great investment. But I will say that these devices can also be used for people without a mobility impairment. In an occupational setting, for example, firefighters, search and rescue, military, and then perhaps if it's light enough and sleek enough to support professions like nursing or surgeons to allow them to stand for long periods of time um, while presumably not fatiguing the user. Well, as long as we don't allow any of the athletes in the Olympics to wear them, I think we'll be we'll be good. Well, I'm just going to wrap up then. Uh, Brock, thanks very much for this insightful uh, interview, if you want to call it that. And, and uh, thanks for contributing to our Let's Talk AI. Thank you very much.